Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Sadat. I'm going to be the president of IEEE at UCLA for this, uh, for this upcoming year. Um, thank you for coming out. I know it's early, um, but basically this event is to showcase some of the technical projects of our club. So if you're not familiar with IEEE at UCLA, um, we're the largest ECE community um, at UCLA, um, primarily undergraduates. And while we have a ton of really cool social events, uh, the sort of backbone of our uh, entire organization is our technical experiences that we provide. Whether that be through workshops, through year-long projects, or through something called SPI that you're going to hear about. So um, whenever I try to explain what these projects really are to people, it always confuses people that don't go to UCLA. They don't understand that it's undergraduates leading other undergraduates and doing lectures and, and teaching each other. Um, and that's, I think, something that makes our club really, really unique. Um, all of our project leads host lectures multiple times a quarter. They host lab hours to help people with their projects and to help them with homework and just um, random things in our lab space. Uh, they create labs. They help people debug at ungodly hours of the night. Um, and I just want to take a moment to have everyone that was a project lead this year uh, stand up and applaud them because this is sort of uh, the, the end of their, their year um, and a lot of work. So if we can have all my project leads stand up. Okay, so I know we're running a little bit late, so I'm not gonna keep rambling for too long. And I wanna give the microphone over to Dominic, of course, uh, project and lab manager for this year. And this is the first time we're offering this event, and it's all thanks to Dominic. So, here you go. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, yeah, so welcome to IEEE's first ever project showcase. So, um, before we really get into the projects, I um, just, just wanted to talk a little bit about what our projects are and what they do. Um, so we have OPS, that's our beginner level electronics project. Uh, it's really um, popular among people that have little or no experience and they really get a, a good chance to uh, um, start with start learning uh, electronics and engineering. Um, and so you're going to hear from them. Um, we also have our four advanced projects and they cover really kind of a lot of different areas of EE. Uh, we have like an embedded systems robotics project called Micromouse. Um, a digital logic FPGA project called DAV, machine learning and computer vision project called Pocket Racers, and then RAP, uh, which is a wireless communication and RF project. Um, so really we kind of cover like a wide variety of areas in the different projects. Um, we also have the Student and Project Initiative Program, which has um, been along, around for a long time, but this is like really the first year that it's uh, been very successful. Uh, we've got three great projects from it, and you're actually going to hear from them first. And just kind of an overview of our projects, we're a very uh, large club. Uh, we have around 250 participants each year across all these projects and SPI. Um, so today you're going to be hearing from the leads and the top students from each project, uh, at least some of the top students from each project. So uh, just a little bit of the schedule for today. Uh, we're going to... Uh, we're doing the intro now, and then we're going to have a little bit of an intro to SPI given by our R&D lead, Tyler. Um, and we're also going to have um, the, our SPI projects present. We, uh, we have three of them. Can't wait uh, to see those. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a break at around 11.10. Um, and then we're going to see the five main IEEE projects. And then we also have a special guest today of ASME. Um, and they have their projects that they're um, going to show off as well. Um, so that'll be after. We'll have lunch at around 1.30. Uh, and then uh, at, just after lunch, uh, we'll have the gallery. So you can go and walk around, see the different tables, see the other projects. That'd be great. Um, participants, too, you can show off your project. But also, I would highly recommend going to uh, check out all the other projects, because people have done a lot of really great work. Um, and then we'll wrap up the event around 4 PM. So um, yeah, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I'm really excited um, to see what we have today. All right, hello. My name's Tyler R&D, but most people just call me Tyler. I am this year's R&D lead for IEEE. So what that entails is I oversee the SPI program. Uh, okay, so SPI, or the Student Project Initiative Program, is a year-long 
track where students, whether that's individually or as part of a small team, uh, they formulate a project idea and then they execute on it throughout the year. So the real, the real mission of SPI is to eliminate some traditional barriers that might hinder students from normally uh, executing, successfully finishing their projects. So whether that's a lack of funding, lack of access to space and tools, or even just uh, mentorship, uh, maybe we can all relate that the only real difference between a class project that gets finished and a personal project that sits on the back burner for a few years is deadlines and accountability. So, um, uh, not sure if you're aware, but this is actually a really special year for uh, this program in particular. So, uh, we've had some successful projects in the past. Uh, Nixley 2 Clock, a uh, student created a single PCB Linux computer. Um, our DAP project is actually uh, the result of an old uh, SPI project. Uh, however, we're coming out of a bit of a drought with this year with three really cool projects. So not to spoil them too much, but we have a Bibimbot, which is essentially a friendly Roomba. <laughs> um, uh, it's a self-driving LiDAR and uh, optical camera uh, vehicle. We have a Ballbot, which if there's any Star Wars fans in the audience, it's a, basically a tall BB-8 droid. And uh, David Zhang at the end with his uh, Bluetooth jammer, uh, if I read that wrong, a uh, radar gun. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, really excited for these. Um, as far as what makes a good SPI project, uh, first and foremost, uh, should challenge the student. Uh, let's see, uh, it's a, mostly a self-guided program. A lot of our, our other year-long projects, there's a lot of help from the leads to facilitate project completion throughout the year. Uh, but with this program, it's primarily the, the students doing the research, uh, overcoming obstacles on their own, with a bit of mentorship when needed. Um, in, in addition to that, the project should be feasible and affordable. Uh, we uh, are actually not necessarily a, a research lab, so if the project is really sophisticated, requires really highly specialized equipment, um, it's probably not a great fit for this program. Um, so completable using lab tools. And finally, um, probably different in scope from the other projects. So if a student has a wants to make a more advanced MicroMouse, they should probably just do the our MicroMouse Furnish program. Um, let's see. I'll hand it back to Dominic, the, who is our R&D lead for next year, to talk about uh, if any of you might be interested in doing this program next year. Yeah, so um, I will be leading next year's SPI. So you may be wondering, oh, why should I do SPI? So really, you'll learn a lot by working on your own project. If you've done an IEEE project in the past, um, chances are you did learn a lot. Um, they really do cover um, a lot of different things and you get to work on the project yourself, which is great. But you may also know, you may also know that um, you kind of can scrape by by uh, just kind of completing the labs and it's kind of takes something from you to really engage with things and learn things well which you definitely can get out of the main projects, um, but it's not necessarily guaranteed. But if you do SPI, you are definitely guaranteed to really understand every single piece of your project, um, which there are some pros and cons to that. It definitely takes commitment, uh, and you've got to be really excited about your idea, um, but, but if you are, um, then you really will probably get a lot out of it, really overseeing the entire idea, design, uh, all the testing, really everything you need to do make make a project. So I think that's a really good experience that um, every really every engineer should get a chance to do to oversee their own project. So SPI is kind of the perfect uh, chance to do that. Um, also, you know, a lot of people are very creative, have lots of cool ideas of things they want, would like to work on, either inspired by their peers or something they saw on YouTube or really just any kind of genius idea that uh, someone's come up with. But I mean, we all struggle with, um, you know, actually being getting around to it with everybody else's uh, busy lives. So if you want to kind of sign up and get the structure of having deadlines and having um, being part of a program, it, it's really a good excuse to uh, finally get done that first personal project that you've always wanted to do. And then I guess another reason, uh, yeah, as Tyler touched on, SPI really isn't in its prime. Um, we had three successful projects this year. There were three projects at the beginning. Well, actually, there were two projects at the beginning of the year. 
and then we got a project. So I, actually, that's like a 150% completion rate of SPI, which is really impressive because actually, looking back in the last five years, it's about a zero or close to zero completion percent completion rate of SPI. Um, there hasn't been a lot of interest in the past, but we've got three uh, great projects this year, and so I'm hoping that next year we can expand even more so um, and, and have quite a lot of uh, SPI projects, people working on cool things. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, uh, reach out to me. Um, uh, yeah, you feel free to talk to me at this event or uh, reach out to me soon or over the summer. Um, I'd be happy to set up like a kind of a casual meeting and talk about things or we can just uh, chat a little bit. Um, and then the actual uh, SBI application will be in the fall uh, with, at the same time as our mainstay projects. Um, but um, would be a great idea to uh, kind of start brainstorming over the summer and doing any planning that you need to do so that way you can uh, get rolling uh, right, right when it starts in the fall. All right, uh, so yeah, I'm uh, looking forward to that. And then I'm gonna hand it back to Tyler, who's gonna introduce our first SBI project. Thank you, Dominic. All right, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Austin here, uh, who will tell us all about Finland Lab. Hi, everyone, um, I'm Austin, and my project is Bibimbot. Um, so Bibimbot was designed to be a little car that's both teleoperable and autonomous um, using ROS. Uh, and it will have real-time data visualization from its LiDAR and camera feed and its odometry. It will be able to be simulated in a, in a physics engine and have object detection. Um, so Bibimbot was inspired because last summer, I did an internship in Berlin uh, for a startup who used ROS. And it was the first time I heard about, let alone worked with it. And if you don't know, ROS stands for Robot Operating System. And it's sort of like, it's less of an operating system and more of an ecosystem or framework for building robotics. So after that internship, um, I really wanted to dive deeper into how everything in ROS um, interacts and connects, which led me to make this project. So this is how everything in Bibimbot will be communicating. So the Raspberry Pi will um, be running ROS, and it's going to get serial data over USB from the LiDAR and camera, and send uh, serial data to the Nano in the form of command velocities, um, which will then send the appropriate PWM signal to the motor driver, um, which will drive the motors, and then send the encoder readings back to the Nano to uh, form a closed loop system. And we can visualize the data that the Raspberry Pi is collecting um, on a workstation, uh, over the network using ROS topic. And to power the whole system in Bibimbot, uh, main power source is a 12 volt LiPo battery, um, which will feed directly into the motor driver, powering the motors, and also into a five volt regulator, which will feed directly into the Nano and the Pi, um, which will piggyback that voltage to the camera and the LiDAR. Um, so for the first half of the project, I was working purely in simulation so I created a simulated version of Bibimbot using like an XML description. Uh, and uh, here is the first part. So this is just simulating all the ROS communications and programs. So essentially on the left side is a physics simulation. Um, on the top right is just visualization software. So it takes in the data that's being sent and visualizes like the odometry and the sensor readings. And the bottom right is just simulating like sending over the command velocities to move over the robot using my keyboard. Yeah, so as you can see, like the odometries, the odometry is working properly. Um, and it was really a pain to get all the inertial measurements in the XML to work properly so that the physics run smoothly. Um, yeah, and the other one is with the LiDAR added. Um, so what's happening here is it's essentially the same thing, but there's also a simulated LiDAR on it. So it's getting um, 
sensor readings from the simulation itself, and the visualization software um, is taking those points and putting it onto uh, this board. And so the physics engine on the right is essentially simulating all the sensor readings um, that it's going to get from the actual version of the robot. So uh, at this point, I was feeling pretty good. All the raw stuff was working, and that would integrate directly with the physical version of Divinbot. Um, but it was at this point of the project where, uh, sorry, I got hit pretty hard by life. Um, a lot, the workload of my classes increased dramatically, and I just lost a lot of time and energy to work on Divinbot. But since then, I've been able to so uh, before this project, I had no experience with CAD or 3D modeling. So it was actually a bit of a um, long process getting to learn it. So I took a little course, got comfortable with it. And I was able to uh, dump this out, this vision of Bibimbot out from my brain. And yeah, as you can see, he's a bowl with flat edges. So the components can map on it. And I bought the 3D printer. <laughs> um, to get familiar with the whole process of that, and I was able to print out a quarter of the uh, Yeah, so my 3D printer is too small to print out the whole thing directly, and it takes a lot of filament and time. So the other three quarters are currently being built right now. Yeah, so that's basically <laughs> the end of the story, unfortunately. I wasn't able to fully finish the project, um, it's not the finish line I was hoping to reach by the end of the quarter, but um, I can genuinely say I learned a lot about ROS, uh, system design, choosing components, and mechanical design. So thank you all for listening to my presentation, and thank you to IEEE for the, uh, for the opportunity. And let's give up one more round of applause for Austin. Yes. Um, learning mechanical design in a quarter when you've never had it anything before is quite the accomplishment. So, um, really amazing job there. Um, let's see, the next project up, we have uh, Mr. Tim uh, with Ball Box. Are you guys ready? All right. Hi everyone, uh, this is our SBI project we've been working on for the past couple months. It's called Ballbot, I'm Takeo, this is Tim, and then we have a third member, Arnov, who can't be here today. So our project began uh, in January when we uh, all participated in a hackathon and we really enjoyed the experience so we were looking for a project we could uh, try next and we came across this MIT Maker Portfolio robot, it's like a one-wheeled system bunch of motors, really complicated. It didn't work in the video, but that kind of got our minds turning, and we found this genre of robots called Ballbots, and we thought we'd make our own version of that. So you must be wondering what Ballbots actually are and what they actually do. Well, many people have attempted this in the past. Uh, in its essential form, the Ballbot is a single-wheeled balancing robot that tilts and rotates in order to counteract its innately unstable system. So the primary goals of these robots are to, firstly, achieve a stable balance, and secondly, be able to control its movement through tilting in certain degrees and directions, as well as rotating itself. The advantages that these robots have over typical robots are that it's omnidirectional, meaning that it can turn very easily on the spot, whereas a typical four-wheeled robot might have a turning radius. It's also very tall, so it can interact with people better. And its high center of mass is actually not a problem, but it rather it plays in our favor because you can kind of imagine the analogy of it being easier to balance a meter stick on your finger than These ballbots typically have four major sections in their systems. Firstly, they always have a power supply or a battery. They always also have a processor or a microcontroller on board. And then thirdly, they have some kind of system of sensors. In most cases, it's an IMU in combination with a lot of encoders for each motor. And then finally, they have some kind of actuating system, which is a combination of motors, omni wheels, and the actual ball that we're moving in order to reorient our, our robot. So does it actually work? Well, here's a quick clip that Theo and I took uh, pretty recently, just this past week of one of our better trials. So you can see here, this is the robot, and I have it in person now. It's on top of a soccer ball, and it's 
thinning is lotus in order to rebalance itself every time it starts to feel like it's falling over. So this was a pretty long run. Uh, it's one of our better runs we've had. It's around 10 seconds balance. You can see it moves around a good amount. So yeah, hopefully we'll try and show you guys that in person later. But uh, probably not here, maybe outside later. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna wanna go over the different subsystems of our robot. So we'll go over the mechanical, electrical, and control system aspects. And then we'll take you through some of the results we've achieved thus far, and then the challenges we faced, and what we see as our next steps. Starting off with the mechanical design, there were two main uh, drivers that um, affected this. The first was to keep it modular so that we could efficiently iterate on our design, and the second was to place as much mass as high up as possible for the reasons Tim mentioned earlier. The chassis is fully 3D printed, and then the power plates are all uh, laser cut acrylic. And then, yeah, so using that CAD screenshot, mm -hmm. that CAD file you've seen, um, we were able to use that alongside with taking real life uh, mass measurements of different parts of our system. And from that, we were able to gather all the system parameters we needed to, a, uh, to fully inform our system dynamics. So that includes masses, measurements of like radii, and um, like different lengths between center of masses. And with that, we were able to also calculate moments of inertia using our CAD file. And for our electrical system, as Mikhail mentioned, it was very simpler and uh, simple and a modularized design. So we mostly use a lot of brake drop boards, but for all our circuitry, we use pretty temporary setup with brake boards and perf boards. We have three different DC power rails to do three, five, and twelve for our multiple logic levels and our motor drivers. And then finally, we chose the Kinky 3.6 as our MCU, mainly because it had an onboard native SD driver that would allow us to uh, read data during our live runs. So in our quick system block diagram here, this is a pretty generalized version, but you can pretty much just see that. It's a battery powering up our MCU, our sensors, and our motors, and then our sensors are reading back data into our MCU, which we're feeding back in order to create uh, driving PWMs for our motors. So the definitely the hardest part of this this project was learning controls because we're not very experts. Uh, well, we weren't. We didn't really know a lot about controls going into this project. So uh, going into the control system, our actual real uh, our real physical lot is obviously in three dimensions. So I'll take it out later so you can see. But because it's in three dimensions, it gives us a pretty complex control system. So instead, in order to simplify things, we decided to split things up into three individual planar models. This kind of just means splitting up this three-dimensional object into three different planes. And then we're going to control each plane independently. So what this is going to give us is two inverted pendulums in the XZ and YZ planes, which in the ideal world are identical, and then one yaw control in the XY plane, which is kind of a bird's eye view if you look at it from the top and the bottom. So right now we have one three-dimensional control system split up into three individual 2D control systems that we're going to try and control. So those are two inverted pendulums and then one, one yaw control. So from those, from those planar models, we derived a lot of physics equations. However, uh, we want to model this in controls. So we decided to go with a state-space model in order to model our physical system with matrices. These use state-space variables, which represent system dynamics. So example of the equations that we have in our case, which are on the top right here. And then from our actual state space model, we need to implement a controller. So we chose to go with an LQR controller, which is a type of full state feedback, which basically just means that we're constantly updating and reading all of our states with each loop. It's also a form of optimal control, which means that it's going to minimize a cost function J, shown on this slide here, that will help maximize performance, aka reducing error, while also minimizing our actuator's effort or our motor's efforts. The result in our case is something similar to PD control, however, this is Here's a pretty rough uh, drawing of what our control system looks like. This is, just keep in mind this is only for one of our inverted pendulum planes, so we actually have two of these. Uh, the primary key concept here is the LQR balance controller, which I mentioned. That outputs a torque, which we convert into our plant for our state-space model. After actuating our system, we feed back the, uh, the readings from our sensors in order to get a good state estimation for our angles from vertical and also our robot speeds. And then that creates an error that we'll, we will feed back into our balance so currently, we're only focusing on balance. We're kind of ignoring position and yaw control. So basically, it can move around as much as it wants or uh, spin around its z-axis as much as it wants because we want to focus on the balance first, and then we'll introduce those later. All right, so here's a couple of results. Firstly, here's a simulated system initial response in MATLAB. Uh, this is to an initial state of 10 degree tilt, which basically just means that 
we're simulating our robot having a 10 degree initial tilt, and then we're seeing how our control loop with our unstable system responds to that. So the, the red box plots are kind of what we might focus on more. So first wave theta is the angle from vertical in one plane, of course, in our x, or I think it's the yz plane. So theta, you can see, starts from a non-zero angle, which is 10 degrees, and then it comes down to zero pretty quickly. So we're pretty satisfied with that. Uh, you can see something similar to theta dot, and finally torque is what we're writing to our motors. So it's showing how much we need to actuate our motors in order to be able to return our system to balance. We've also in included the LQR matrices here. These, you can kind of just think of as weights or weighting matrices for our cost function, which tells you how much we value balancing our robot versus how much we value minimizing the effort involved in running our motors. Here, uh, we're showing you guys a plot of some real test data we've taken when we actually ran our robot. Um, in orange, you have angular displacement in the yz plane, and in blue you can see the torque response from our controller, and intuitively it kind of makes sense to see that when there's a large angular displacement, you can see our, our control system reacting and trying to reach stability again. Yeah, moving on to the main challenges we faced during the project, the first and major one would be our motor characteristics. We observed really poor torque performance at most uh, PWM duty cycles, and uh, we also ran into another problem kind of alongside using PWM uh, duty cycles. PWM signals to control our motors that inherently control voltage, whereas our whole control system is outputting a torque, which requires current control from our motor controllers, which currently we're not able to do. Um, and then self-inflicted challenge was we mixed up degrees and radians a lot, which was really tough purposes. And uh, finally, uh, a couple times we noticed our motors were demanding more current than our motor drivers could supply, which basically meant we had to replace our motor drivers two or three times. And yeah, those are the main challenges we faced. Yeah, and uh, moving on to next steps, the biggest thing we see helping our robot performance is to implement that current, current control uh, motor drivers that I just mentioned. We think that will have really large effects in our performance. And uh, alongside that, we want to also start implementing the X, Y, yaw control, which is uh, kind of the first step into possibly uh, breaking out into position control of our robot, which means it can actually control its position and move around to different locations. And uh, further down the line, we might also want to start developing a 3D model, uh, 3D state-space representation of our robotic system, um, which is definitely the most encompassing and accounts for all the coupling effects between the uh, split up planar model we're using. Okay, yeah, so that kind of wraps up our presentation, but uh, we're not going to do a live demo here because I don't think we can on this ground. It's kind of hard to see, so we might do it outside later. But I'm just going to take it out of this package to show you guys what it actually looks like in person, but feel free to look at it more later. Here's this guy. It's, it's pretty weighty, which kind of helps in, his, uh, in our favor because I think the more mass it has, the, the more time it's going to take to fall over, and our motors are pretty strong, so they're pretty deep. While David over here is getting fed up with his radar gun, um, those two are being a little too humble. Um, I'd like to say that when they said they, a few months, uh, they started this project uh, this quarter actually. <laughs> um, so everything you just saw, um, they've it's come together entirely in the past couple months. So huge shout out to them, and they did it almost completely independently of any help or input from me. But, and uh, the fact that they got working is just really cool. So uh, I'm sure you guys are wondering what uh, <laughs> what this contraption is to my right. So uh, I'll let David take it away. Okay, hello, uh, I'm David, and uh, this is my FMCW radar project. So first of all, what is FMCW radar? So FMCW stands for Frequency Modulated Continuous Wave. And continuous wave basically means that it's always on. And that's like, as opposed to like a pulse radar, which sends out pulses. And also, uh, it's frequency modulated, so the frequency actually changes. And in the red, like in the 
diagram, the red line uh, shows the frequency of the transmitter signal, and then the green line shows uh, the reflected signal from an object. So let's talk about how it works. So uh, the transmitter sends out a rising frequency, and then because it takes time for the signal to bounce off an object, the received signal is a bit delayed. And if we use a mixer to subtract two frequencies, you can get a constant frequency corresponding to the difference. So if you imagine subtracting the red line from the green line, uh, you get a straight line. And then if the red and green line were further apart, which corresponds to like a larger time, dis like time delay, then you'd get a higher frequency. And then based on that frequency, we can determine distance because we would know how, like what the time delay was. So that's basically how it works. And then we're gonna talk about the radar equation. So uh, it turns out that the amount of power you get back is uh, dependent on the frequency, the distance, uh, the amount of power you're transmitting, and also the antenna gain. And the, also finally, uh, the radar cross-section of the object you're trying to measure. So like if the object is like a person, then uh, you can approximate it as like as having a cross section of like one meter square, whereas if it's like an automobile, it would be like 100. And that basically means like the car would reflect like 100 times the signal as a person. And the reason why it's important to like look at received power is because of noise and also like the noise like figure of the system. So the, so the system would add some noise and like, we also have like a noise, like, we also have like a noise limitation because we're working in the real world. So you can only receive signals which are like somewhat above the noise floor, which, yeah, which limits the distance that you can measure. Okay, so let's talk about uh, my design. So the frequency is 2.4 to 2.5 gigahertz because that's like a frequency that I'm legally allowed to transmit in. Uh, the transmitted power is 26 dBm, which in like uh, watts is bit under half a watt. The antenna gain is 14 dBi, which means uh, my antenna is about like 20 times more direct than an omnidirectional antenna. Like it's pretty focused. And the sweep rate is one kilohertz, and that's basically how fast I change the frequency. And the maximum detection range uh, for people, which I've been able to test like, is about 380 meters. So I've been able to uh, find people who are 380 meters away using my system. Yeah, so here's the block diagram of like how all the components work together. So let's talk about the uh, transmit side. So first we have the voltage controlled oscillator and it basically generates the frequency sweep for my radar system. And uh, it's on the top right corner there. Uh, the board is very small because I have to use 0402 components. And then uh, the triangle wave is generated with a ramp generator, which basically, like, it's literally just an analog circuit which generates a triangle wave at one kilohertz. And then on the uh, bottom middle, you can see the measurements that I took using the spectrum analyzer. And you can see that the output frequency is very linear across time, which is what we want. And on the left, we have, like, a uh, circuit diagram. I have to change the components to change the frequency, but it's basically the design I use. Okay, next we have the power amplifiers. So the VC, so like the signal from the oscillator is very small. It's like under a milliwatt and we want to amplify it. So what my power amplifiers do is it amplifies the signal from uh, under a milliwatt to about half a watt. And we have multiple stages. And then some of the difficulties I had were uh, with impedance matching. So like some of my transistors had impedances that were two ohms or something, and I had to match it to 50 ohms, and that was quite difficult. And there's also stability issues sometimes where my amplifiers would start oscillating, and that was bad because it would basically generate other frequencies, which I didn't want. And uh, and look at my amplifiers on the right, and we have a plot of the S parameters in the, on the left side, which shows like the gain and also how matched they were. And you can see we have a dip at, at 2.45 gigahertz, which is what I want. We have 
very funny. <laughs> okay, anyways, uh, we also have a coupler. So the coupler basically takes some of the transmitter output and then it feeds it back into the receiver. And the reason why I need to do this is so I can use a mixer to take the difference between the transmitted signal and the signal which gets uh, received after bouncing off the target. And my coupling was 15 dB. And again, you can look at the pictures. Uh, finally, we have the antenna, uh, which I used the antenna design, which is basically made out of cans usually, but I didn't have that, so I had to buy a level two for me. And I measured the gain to be 14 dBi, which is pretty high. Uh, I measured it just by pointing it at the spectrum analyzer and using the free uh, transmission equation to determine what the gain should be, since I know all the other numbers. And yeah, you can see my antenna is pretty matched over the entire frequency range, so that's also very good. And now let's talk about what I did on the receiver side. So first we need an a low noise amplifier. So I have a two stage design and I think the gain is about 27 decibels. And I can't measure the noise figure unfortunately because I do not have the tools necessary, but the noise figure basically just determines how much noise the amplifier adds to the existing signal. And you want that to be as low as possible. Okay. And then next we have the mixers which actually do the frequency subtraction. So uh, the mixer design I chose is the uh, IQ mixer. So the idea is uh, with normal mixers, you get both the lower frequency side and the like upper frequency side. But then with IQ mixers, you get to select one of them. And because I only want, I only care about uh, signals which are like lower than the transmitted frequency, I can just look at that section, and then the rest of the section gets ignored. Like if you use a normal mixer, you have twice the amount of noise, but then using this, uh, you don't get that. And we have uh, microwave circuits to introduce the 90 degree phase shift and everything. And then the mixer is uh, basically the, well, I have a cursor, but it's these things here. And I have like diodes to mix it down and stuff. So. Next we have the uh, low frequency amplifier. Uh, or IF amplifier. So the goal was to amplify all low frequency signals so it can be properly detected by the ADC. Like if your signal is really small, then the ADC, then you're not using the entire range of the ADC, which hurts performance. I also uh, tried to do equalization. So uh, with further objects, you get like a much smaller return signal. It's uh, basically if you go 10 times as far, uh, your signal will be 10,000 times smaller. So I would need an amplifier to compensate for that. And uh, basically, my amplifier uh, makes higher frequencies, uh, like 10,000 times higher, so it all evens out. And that way, uh, if we look at like a simulated plot here of a bunch of like targets, uh, after we equalize, they're all the same strength. That makes it easier for the ADC to pick them out. Okay, now let's go on to the software part. So on the FPGA side, uh, which is on the red Pattaya, uh, we have data at 125 mega samples per second. And that's obviously too fast for our computer to process. So I used uh, CIC and FIR filters to lower it to one mega sample per second. And then uh, I used the Ethernet. Uh, I used an Ethernet cable to transmit all the data from the FPGA to my computer. And I still don't know how Verilog works, so don't ask me any questions about it. I just copied someone's code. Yeah, but uh, in the bottom left side, you can see the filter I used. And uh, so the blue line is the CIC filter, and then the orange line is the compensating FIR filter. And then overall, that gets me a pretty flat response, and then up till about uh, 470 kilohertz, and then just drops off, which is what I want. And then uh, next, on the computer side, uh, we do a two-dimensional FFT to get the velocity and position data. And the computer uses uh, SVL to graph the FFT data, uh, 
and I coded everything in C, which might have been a mistake, but I guess it works. Uh, that was not very fun. And then uh, in the bottom here, uh, you can see basically how the two-dimensional FFT works. So if we only get one sweep, then we have a one-dimensional like vector, and then if you take the FFT, you can only get the range. Then if we have multiple sweeps here, and then we put them all into a grid, and then we take the FFT, then uh, one axis still represents the range, but then the other axis uh, represents the velocity, since we're measuring how fast the uh, phase is changing across time, which corresponds to velocity. And then if you had multiple antennas, which I don't, then you could do a three-dimensional FFT to also get angular information. So here's a video demonstration I took. Uh, it was taken Thursday at 10.30, and I think there was a lot more interference because there are a lot more people on campus, and they're probably all using Wi-Fi, which uses the same frequency. But here's the video. Yeah. On the right side, you can see someone running, and then uh, on the left side, you have the plot. So here's the uh, dot representing the person. And you can see that here's the bike racks and the UCLA bike shop. And then if we actually, I can go full screen. Uh, yeah, it might be easier. Yeah, so if we look on the uh, actual map, you can see it's about 100 meters. And then from our radar plot, we also get 100 meters. So the distance is pretty accurate. Yeah, and then you can see like this dot is still moving, which is pretty based, I guess. And then I think eventually, as you get to the end, like, uh, it starts disappearing. Uh, might be because of all the interference and stuff. And then once uh, we go on the return trip, uh, we should be able to see another dot but on the bottom because the velocity is now negative. So uh, I think you'll have to wait a bit for it to show up. Yeah, but you can see that on the return trip, uh, velocity is negative, and we have the dot on the bottom now because it corresponds to a negative velocity. Uh, no, it's someone else. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, other test subjects. <laughs> It should be a lot more noticeable now. Uh, it's right here. So. And then you can see all the interference we have, like, over here. This stuff uh, it shouldn't be there, but it's probably from some kind of, like, Wi-Fi signal or maybe Bluetooth. Let's go on to another video I took. Uh, so this one, uh, we are tracking two people on Sunday, uh, we were walking. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they don't know I was tracking them. But. <laughs> yeah, but you can see, like, uh, this is the dot representing the people, and then because there's much less interference, since I don't think anyone's doing anything important at 1 a.m., uh, it's much better. And you can clearly see where they are up to about 380 meters when the, the road ends. Not up by five times because you guys don't probably don't want to watch someone walking for like three minutes. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the received signal at 380 meters should be negative 97 dBm, which uh, is 0 0.2 picowatts. So the amount of power received is very small, and that's why it's pretty important to have no interference. And on the bottom left corner, we can see that uh, according to Google Maps, it's 390 meters, so that's pretty good for accuracy. Yeah, so let's talk about future improvements I could make. So I could get an ADC with more bits, and that way I can have a higher dynamic range, which means I can, which means that like if I have a very large signal and a very small signal, I can see both of them. And uh, I could have more antennas to get 
Angular information too. Uh, I only have one receive antenna, but if I had multiple transmit and multiple receive antennas, I'd be also be able to determine uh, which angle things came from. Like, I, yeah, and then uh, maybe a better IF amplifier might be better since uh, my current one has some issues at, uh, with like not being able to detect closer objects. And uh, finally, we could choose a different frequency, which doesn't have that many interference sources, and we could also get better lab equipment because I like having better lab equipment. <laughs> So let's talk about companies that were very helpful. So uh, Quilthrap for sending me an inductor sample kit. I also read Papaya for letting me borrow one of their uh, uh, red Papaya boards, which had 14 bits. Uh, so I asked them for a 14 bit one because that had more dynamic range and they sent me one. So that's very cool and thanks to them. People I'd like to thank, uh, we have David Bong, uh, who's a grad student, and he answered all my questions. Uh, he's been very helpful. Also, uh, this guy called Pavel Demin, uh, he's the guy who wrote the code, which I stole off GitHub, <laughs> because I don't know how to do Verilog. And then uh, also, uh, I used a ThinkPad from the computer to do all the FFT stuff, uh, so, because as an Ethernet port, unlike my current like, computer, so I can actually connect it, and uh, please don't take away the RAM and battery next time. Uh, I have to buy all of that off Amazon, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just gonna ask for questions or something. Okay, fine, does anyone have any questions? Okay, well, I guess not, so, uh, okay, well, hey, let's trick question. Was there a particular frequency range that you were thinking about that is both legal and would have less interference? Well, uh, I think you'd have to go pretty high up, because uh, the next one's 5 gigahertz, but that one's also used by Wi-Fi, and I think most Wi-Fi nowadays use 5 gigahertz instead, so you'd have to probably go up to, like, 10 gigahertz or maybe 24. And that's probably going to be very annoying. So, <laughs> yeah, we should just buy, we should just pay the FCC like five like million dollars to buy like Spectrum, right? Very cool. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I guess not. So uh, enjoy your break or something. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, David, um, and the other um, SPI projects. Uh, very amazing work, um, all done this year, um, and all done by these students. So that's uh, really incredible. And so uh, another round of applause for uh, all of our three SPI projects. So, uh, yeah, we're going to take a quick break um, for around 15 minutes, and then we'll be back with our main projects. Um, we, we, have, we have five projects that are all going to do presentations. Um, so, yeah, go ahead and take a break. I think we still have a little bit of uh, Porto's breakfast left, so if you haven't gotten any yet, go ahead and grab that in the breezeway, uh, and then we'll, we'll get started in about 15 minutes. So uh, come back at uh, 11.25. Uh, this is uh, my Tripoli at UCLA, our project showcase, uh, showcasing um, all the hard work that our students have done this year. Um, so now uh, we're going to talk about our main five projects. Uh, if you missed the beginning, we have um, five projects. We have Ops, which is an introduction directory project, and then we have four other projects that are kind of have their own different focus areas in EE. Um, a robotics and embedded systems pro uh, project called Micromouse, um, an RF and communications uh, project called REP, uh, computer vision machine learning project called Pocket Racers, and then a digital logic project called DAV. And you're actually, we're actually going to hear from DAV first. Um, so, um, Without spoiling anything, here is Dav. All right, hello everyone. My name is Sadat. 
and I'm Tim. And we were this year's leads for uh, the Digital Design Architecture and Verification Project. So, um, if you're unfamiliar, this is a project that focuses on FPGAs and digital logic. Um, basically, it's a field programmable gate array, which is a lot of like random buzzwords. But the idea is, um, when you want to design a processor or like a specific type of chip, um, you often simulate it. Um, but sometimes that's not enough. You want to try it with different peripherals, different um, things in hardware. And an FPGA lets you do that. So it's a reconfigurable circuit that you can program using um, a hardware descriptive language called System Verilog. Um, and that's what we do in, in DAO. We learn System Verilog and we have a few labs um, that focus on using that FPGA right there. So to get a little more uh, specific about what uh, DAV actually does, in, uh, throughout the year, we teach people from the very basics how to design, um, you know, digital design uh, concepts in uh, System Verilog, and we do that through a bunch of different labs that uh, start with the basics, with just uh, making like a little simple calculator using the the um, uh, display digits and switches and buttons and everything, up to more complex things like. Uh, implementing a hardware FFT or uh, implementing a hardware driver for I squared C and uh, a display driver for VGA, right? So uh, throughout the year, we, we teach everyone how all of those component uh, all of those components work, and they put it all together at the end of the year into two different capstone projects. This year, we uh, piloted a new uh, design where instead of just having one capstone track, we actually have two. The original was Digital Audio Visualizer, the original name for uh, DAV. <laughs> and um, is basically where you would implement a hardware FFT to uh, display the uh, visualization of um, the ambient audio spectrum uh, in the surrounding area. And then the other project that we had was more open-ended, uh, which was basically just using all the tools that you've learned throughout the year, create something cool, like a video game or some sort of tech demo or just whatever you wanted. So. Um, Right now, we're going to go ahead and give the mic to a couple of our presenters, a couple of whom who have done the first track and a couple of whom who have done the second track. Um, to start off with, I think we have Kevin. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the fast forward transform. I think some of you may be familiar with just what a forward transform is in general. So a forward transform, uh, we take our signals and time domain, and we're gonna convert it into the frequency domain. A fast forward transform actually is a really efficient algorithm um, that takes that time domain, discrete time domain signal, and converts it into frequency domain. So this is uh, just a basic eight point FFT. So we're taking um, eight time domain samples, and we're gonna be performing a bunch of multiply and accumulate algorithms in between and convert it into our frequency domain signal. And that frequency domain signal, we can display onto our monitor. Um, so obviously, this fast forward transform can be scaled up um, because it's just really splitting signal in half and half and half in an array X2 format uh, many times over. So this is a 64 point fast forward transform uh, butterfly diagram and it is uh, many times more complicated than the 16 point, uh, or 8 point that we just saw. So I implemented the 64 point on these FPGA boards, and um, in each of them, there's, at uh, each stage, there is 32 um, little multiplied and accumulated butterfly units, um, and we're gonna be, we've used them six times. Uh, so, it's a lot of moving around data and wiring up your butterfly modules in, so that you can get a uh, time of a frequency domain result. And some of the problems that we run into is the fact that this takes 12 minutes to compile and synthesize onto the FPGA, which of course, those of you who write the software code, um, you might balk at the fact that 12 minutes takes is a while to compile. Um, so it's a little hard to simulate or hard to debug just because of the fact that it takes 12 minutes and also because uh, there are so many points that you have to wire up. But uh, with that, I think
think I'm going to hand it off to uh, Nathan and Jackie. Oh, is, or there's a recording. Oh, yeah. This is the 64 point I think gave. Um, Blinding Lights by The Weeknd, which is an awesome song, in my opinion. <laughs> So I head off to Nathan Jack, I think. Yeah. All right. So my name is Jackie. My name is Nathan, and we chose the we chose the uh, project or the game track for this year. Um, and then this is our project FPGA Hero. So FPGA Hero is supposed to be reminiscent of your favorite childhood games, Guitar Hero and Piano Tiles. We use I2C, the serial communication um, protocol, which uses two wires, SC and SCL. We implemented, we implemented I2C in hardware, and that was how we actually communicated between controllers and the actual FPGA. Because we're trying to make Guitar Hero, we actually did experiment with a couple different Wii Guitar Hero controllers, but due to internal issues, we weren't able to make it work, so we decided to use two Wii nunchucks and use the four buttons to correspond with each of the guitar strings on the screen. Oh, and then up here is like a block diagram of like our internal game logic. We have like our I squared C controller, um, our clock divider, like generate all the clock inputs and outputs, um, and then all the game logic. Um, and then after that, uh, because it's a rhythm music game, we needed to pick a song, right? So we chose one of our favorite songs, I'll Make a Man Out of You, from the hit movie Mulan. Um, <laughs> and then we spent a good amount of time just like going through the sheet music and like writing out each each like notes on that and how they appear in the game. And then we, we took those notes and then saved them to the uh, read-only memory of the FPGA. Yeah, so the visual aspect of our game is really important, but you can't have a music game without, you guessed it, the music. So we wanted to implement the MP3 file on the FPGA, but it was a little complicated. So instead, we decided to use an Arduino and a DXP player to play the actual song. And the way we synced it was that when the game started, the FPGA sent a signal directly to the Arduino, which started um, our music. and. In all together, it looks something like this. It's a little quiet, but you can go outside and play it after the presentation. Okay. Next, we have another group that did the digital audio visualizer. These guys did a really cool job, so. Up for uh, Honan and Ellen. Hello, my name is Honan. Uh, I'm, my name is Adam. And, uh, we have been planned uh, the 32 piece um, FFT engine on the FPGA board, and uh, uh, it can transform the uh, uh, sounds that are captured by the microphone from the time domain to the uh, frequency domain. Yeah, so apart from the FFT algorithm, uh, you have already known from the previous slides, uh, we also implemented uh, low-pass filtering by doing the uh, uh, convolution uh, on the uh, time domain. So uh, as you can see on the next slide. Oh yeah, uh, so this is the, the, uh, the normal FFT. And we also do some variations uh, of the color. So we set the uh, so we uh, set different uh, right value for different uh, horizontal position, and we set different value for uh, green display on uh, vertical position, and also our uh, blue value uh, varies with time. Yeah, so you can see the uh, change of the color. And so uh, this is our uh, low pass filtering. Uh, as you can see, the uh, low frequency the low frequency components are amplified and the high uh, frequency uh, components are surprised. Yeah, so that's basically what we did. Hello, uh, I'm Claire. And I'm Prem. Uh, and our project this year was uh, FPGA Tetris. So what that meant is we made Tetris on an FPGA controlled by the Donkey Kong and Jungle Beat Bongos for the Nintendo Game 2 controller. So what this meant is we had fancy graphics to get head speed of looking nice uh, on the VGA display, and then we had memory with Ping Pong RAM, and most notably, we had to hack the Bongo protocol. Um, 
Yeah, so what does it mean to have a controller? What that means is we tried and failed to find documentation online for how to communicate with the bongos, so we had to do it ourselves. So how we did that is we looked at how the bongo communicated with a reliable device, Tim's Wii, uh, and then we looked at it with the logic controller. So uh, what we did is after we were able to identify the pattern, we designed the circuit to reliably communicate with the bongos, uh, and then we had to figure out what it was saying. So um, being CS majors, we wrote a Python script to decode the output, and then we had to debounce them, and then we were able to use them as inputs to our game. Yeah, so I guess um, the main thing to note here is that there are a few challenges that come with trying to use the bongos that don't appear with like other types of controllers, most notably that uh, typical controllers are synchronized, the um, peripheral is synchronized with the FPGA, and what that means is, like you saw with the I2C protocol, there's a separate clock line that is passed between the two devices that basically makes sure that they stay in sync. With the bongos, instead of two lines, one for like the clock and one for data, we just have one singular data line. And what this means is that basically the bongo has its own internal clock and it kind of just throws bits at the FPGA at, in very rapid succession, and the FPGA has to kind of no, no, pick the clock speed and kind of try to catch them at, at, in a reliable. And of course, this would work if the clock in the bongos was reliable, but unfortunately it's not reliable. It's supposed to be roughly four microseconds per bit, but instead it was like anywhere between 2.8 and 4.5. So like there were a lot of, um, I guess a lot of issues with respect to trying to figure out how best we can sample those bits and uh, send them to the bongos and receive the data in a way that actually allows us to process them and use them meaningfully in a game. As you can see, this is a video we took about an hour ago. Uh, hitting the left side of the bongos will move a piece to the left, hitting the right side will move a piece to the right. Uh, if you slap the sides of the bongos, there's a microphone that picks up the audio and it can be used to uh, rotate the piece. And then as you can see, there's a line pairing right now that hits the piece that one and pulls into the line. All right, those were just some of our fantastic projects from DAV this year. Um, thank you all for uh, listening to our presentation. But here's Dominic. Uh, thanks, Dev. Uh, next up, we have Micromouse, our maze-solving robot project. So um, I'm going to hand it off to Megan and Nathan. All right. Hello. So we are the Micromouse leads for this year, and I'm Megan. I'm Nathan. And this is Micromouse. So you might be wondering. <laughs> well, here's the rest of our speakers, too. They're right over there. They'll introduce themselves in a little bit. So you might be wondering. What exactly is Micromouse? So Micromouse is a small autonomous maze solving robot, and like um, some of you guys may know from, for example, the Veritasium video, that there are several regional competitions throughout the world, and like the goal for a general Micromouse competition is that you're trying to go from your start point and reach the middle as fast as possible or get as close as possible. And here at UCLA, we have one of such like regional competitions at a multi-school university level which is AMC, which we hosted last weekend. And yeah, on top of hosting AMC, we also have a MicroMouse program where we teach our students the basics like embedded C, PCB design, and control systems, kind of the basics to kind of hit the ground running in such a competition. Here's an example run from last year, from like the year before, of our, our mouse competing and completing the maze. Yeah, so you can see that it starts in one of the corners and then it is trying to get to the uh, center four squares in the, in, the middle, in the middle there. And you might be curious, like, why is it not directly going there? Like, the mouse starts off with no information about the maze, so right now it's trying to learn where all the walls are and just kind of find its way on what it thinks is the fastest path to the middle. And with each move and with each wall I've learned, it kind of recalculates and tries to figure out what's the best way to get there. Yeah, and then this was, again, this is the All-American Micromouse competition that we, or that we hold every year, and then we invite like, other, other local California schools to come and compete. Um, and then, yeah. And it hits the middle. <laughs> 
how the competition works and how the um, program is, but what do we actually do in the MicroMask pro Micromask program here at UCLA? So we, the goal is to teach like students from the, from the ground up, like from scratch, how to actually build one of these base level robots themselves. So then we start with like the basics of like embedded programming, it's like, oh, we give them like a starter kit. Um, that's actually the PCB design for the starter kit right there that we hand to them at the start of the year. And then we teach them the basics of like, oh, how to start, how to, light up an LED, up to how to control the motor, to get like the motor feedback from it, um, and then reading the IR sensors so we can detect the, the light around it and where the walls are, and then also how to like keep track of the walls to be seen in order to solve the maze. Um, and then throughout the, throughout the program, we just like teach, teach them all these concepts, and then once they, once, they, um, once they actually know how to work with the embedded programming, then they work on actually designing their own hardware themselves. So we use Autodesk Eco for, as our PCB design software, and then all of winter quarter, they spend it just designing their own robot, like taking parts, going through data sheets, like designing everything themselves, and then we order the parts for them. And then in spring quarter, all those parts arrive, and then they get ready for the competition. And in terms of like more internal for how the actual controlling works, uh, we have this diagram here. This is like a, a simulation of one of the feedback control algorithms that we use in MicroMouse. It's called PID, Proportional Integral Derivative. And basically how we use it is just like, to figure out how, if we want to go like a certain distance, we need to look at the feedback to see how far we've gone. It's like when you're driving a car and you have, you're have you going to a specific spot, you want to look at like where you're going to that spot. And if, as you're approaching it, you want to slow down. Like if you're far away, you want to just like go really fast. Um, that's just one of the feedback control algorithms that we use. And then also we use a maze solving algorithm called flood fill, which I believe Parth and Matthew might talk about a little bit later. Um, yeah, that's just like an overview of, of like some of the concepts that we teach in MicroMouse and that they develop and learn throughout the year. Yeah, now to pass it on to Jason Zapp. Okay, so hi, my name's Jace. Hi, I'm Zach. And we were the maker of that mouse, which is called Fred the Fucking Horse. Um, so our rack can basically be broken down into two parts, the software and the hardware. And so for our software, the algorithm that we use to solve the maze is actually called flood fill. And this is a little video of it going, essentially. So the way the algorithm works is um, the rat starts out with no idea of where the walls are. And then they label the every unit is labeled with a number, and when the rat is either surrounded by all walls or all larger numbers, it recalculates and essentially finds the shortest path to the center of the maze. And um, we have it coded so that it goes from the starting position to the center, and then the center and back to find more walls. So yeah. But in the real world, it doesn't work as well as simulation. The mouse doesn't make perfect turns or go the exactly perfect distance every time. So besides just the regular PID control that I previously explained, we also implemented IR corrections, where we would use our IR sensors to not only find the wall, but also guarantee that our position was a lot closer than it, than it was. By So front and back, we would go close to the front of the wall, and then if we're too close, we could back up or get closer, depending on the reading. And same kind of with left and right, is like if we're too close to the left wall or too close to the right wall, we could adjust to be in the middle of the cell. It doesn't work if there's none of them, but this was really useful for our rat, which unfortunately ended up a little bigger than we thought it would be. So it was, you know, kind of hard to fit into the cell. And the next part is hardware, and this is where we struggled a little bit more because it was our first time with soldering, PCB design, and just using embedded systems in general. So, um, like Zach mentioned, we had a lot, a little bit of trouble with our PCB design. First, with the size, the cells of the maze are actually not that big, and our rat takes up a lot of the cells. So turning, and it had to be really accurate when turning or like making U turns, stuff like that. Um, and also, we forgot to connect our motors to power, so that was a struggle. So that's why there's this big red line. Um, Wire, 
Yes, it was always a lot of challenges. <laughs> Maybe not the motors to power, but it, uh, I think we learned a lot because we never did all this and we got hands on experience with like all this stuff as well as like the software that we wouldn't have gotten elsewhere. Hi, I'm Matthew. And my name is Pars. And our uh, mouse is named Bigger Chunky, affectionately named after the carton of chocolate milk I left on my desk over winter break. Uh, unsuspecting but lethal. And uh, our third partner was Leon, but he couldn't make it today, unfortunately. So one thing I wanted to implement in our uh, micro mouse, I was inspired by Caden's run last year, where he won AAMC by taking a slightly longer path, but it was faster because there were less turns. So I implemented um, weighted flood fill. And so what it does is it optimizes the path to take less turns and optimize for uh, like straighter streaks of run. So in non-weighted flood fill, each cell distance is weighted the same. It's weighted by one value. So every cell that you move increases the, uh, like the run distance by one. But in weighted flood fill, I made it so that each cell is 10. Uh, each turn you take is 15. And each consecutive cell you move in a row is negative one. So it optimizes for uh, longer straightaways, and that's because turns usually take longer to, to do, and they often cause error because going straight is usually a bit more precise than turning. Turning can already mess stuff up. And as you can see uh, on the two graphics, the left is uh, this year's maze with non-weighted flood fill, and the right is this year's maze with weighted flood fill. And you can see they take quite different paths. The non-weighted flood fill takes the left path, which involves more turns, but is typically shorter in distance while the uh, weighted flood fill takes the bottom path, which has much less turns, uh, but is typically longer. And so using this, we could actually, we have a button on our mouse that we could change which flood fill algorithm it uses to calculate which is the fastest path. And so this would give us a lot of flexibility when we actually do our runs, uh, which was really nice when it came to competition day. All right, so now let's talk about the biggest problem that we encountered with our mouse, and that was that our mouse was just way too big. So. As you can see in the diagram, our wheels were a lot lower on the mouse than they should have been, which means that its center of rotation was a lot lower. So whenever it tried to do a 180 degree turn, it would always hit the wall. So our solution for this was just try to move backwards. But again, this doesn't always work because there's no IR sensors in the back, so it's really hard to actually move backwards straight. So in the end, what we decided to do was that whenever our mouse hit a dead end, it would just save the maze data to the microcontroller splash and just hope for the best as it moved backwards so that even if it didn't, or even if it like failed while going backward, it could just use its saved data in the next one. And then in the competition, this is like the actual competition maze. So what our mouse did was like initially it took the purple path and even if it failed, at the dead end over there, it would know that there's a dead end over there and take different paths in the, net, in the following run. And this helped us tremendously during the competition because a lot of other mice would just keep taking the purple path over and over again. And if they did fail, uh, and a lot of them did like fail in the exact same spot, what would happen is like their mice would just continue going back there over and over again, whereas uh, by saving the flash, we could take different runs. So yeah, that's it from us. Matthew, and that's all we got for Micromouse. Thanks so much, Micromouse. Uh, next up, we have Pocket Racers, which is a brand new project to IEEE this year. So they've got some really exciting stuff to share with you. Awesome. Thank you, Dom. Uh, hi, I'm Cameron. I'm Prem. Uh, Prem from Pocket Racers, no relation to Prem from Dad. Yeah. <laughs> so, like Dom said, uh, Pocket Racers is a brand new project this year. Uh, so just to give you like a quick overview of like what the goals were and what we're trying to do. Um, so the goal of Pocket Racers was to teach students how to make a small self-driving car that would use a Raspberry Pi and a camera uh, to perform computer vision algorithms in order to navigate a track. Uh, so to this end, we taught a variety of machine learning and computer vision concepts um, over the course of the year through several lectures and uh, also by giving students uh, several labs so that they could 
apply all these skills in a very hands-on way. Uh, so some examples of things we did uh, was we showed or we made a lab that counted the number of dots in a dice, and also uh, a lab that would detect whether or not it was uh, a camera was looking at like a stop sign or an arrow, and then would drive the car accordingly. Um, so like you know it would go in the direction of the arrow or uh, stop when it saw a stop sign, and all these things were done using just pure like algorithmic computer vision concepts. Um, and then later on we started doing more machine learning stuff. Uh, and we used uh, CNNs to try and classify playing cards, um, and had a lot of success with that. We'll talk more about that um, later. So briefly, I will explain what exactly goes into making a self-driving car, because there's a lot of moving parts, of course. It's a little bit more uh, complicated than you might imagine. So of course, the, uh, at the very core of a self-driving car, you need three things. You need some way to process the environment around it. For that, we have a camera sensor to basically take in visual data. This would look at things like stop signs, or arrows, or racetrack walls, or things like that. Of course, you also need motors that can actually drive the car. So we have those in the um, wheels at the back. We have a, a large, a chunky motor that can actually propel the car forward and backwards. In the front, we have a small motor, a servo motor, which is basically meant to control a steering bar that turns the wheels left or right, and then at the core of all this, we have some sort of like brain, like a computer that basically tells the motors how fast to go, tells the steering where to turn, and um, takes and does so by reading in information from the camera. And of course, we have a power source to power all of this. We use batteries. So now we will talk about um, some of the actual, like I guess, the overall architecture of the Parker system specifically, and some of the challenges that students face when implementing certain things. And we have our first team. I'm Bhavik. Uh, unfortunately, Ava couldn't make it. But, yep. Yeah. All right. So I'll go ahead and give a like little uh, overview of kind of the hardware and the structure of the Pocket Racer. This is a little love letter to the RPI core. I really just want to highlight kind of the accessibility and ease of use of this platform. Uh, one thing that I want to point out in our first lab, like fall quarter, we basically assembled all of the hardware in pretty much just a few hours, uh, assembling uh, pre-printed components in the RPI core and an RGP module, and then. You know, basically in the span of that short amount of time, we have all of the hardware that we really need to kind of make this track look like hard. So um, kind of see the structure of it over here, the RGP module that connects to the brains that I mentioned. And then we also got to do some things like working with the Python script. Uh, we used OP the OPCD library um, to help our car recognize things like arrows, whether they were pointing forward, left or right, and stop signs. And that kind of gives the car that directional capability. We also used GPI control for the motors in order to let it drive based on that input, and then you kind of end up with a platform that sees, processes, and reacts. So that's easy as pie. Okay, so that was what we did in fall quarter. Uh, in winter quarter, we focused uh, a lot more on the machine learning, neural networks, kind of like computer science aspect of what exactly it takes to make a robotic system such as a pocket racer car actually see. So, uh, like I mentioned, um, we, the, um, the, the main uh, driver of the Pocket Racer's vision is neural networks, specifically CNN or convolutional neural networks, which are a type of, a type of neural network which is um, kind of better for image processing or computer vision reasons, um, or for computer vision problems. So uh, we covered topics that are also covered in like the class uh, ECE C147, which is deep learning and uh, neural network. So it was like basically like parallel what we were doing in the class and in the lab. So it was pretty cool that we got some more experience working with neural networks uh, on another project. So one of the labs we did was um, we had to implement a neural network to identify playing cards. So all 52 of the standard playing cards plus jokers. Um, so that's 53 playing cards. But with the neural network of just 12 layers, we were able to achieve 95% accuracy um, in, ident in identifying this in the playing cards. So that kind of shows like the strength of neural networks for image processing and computer vision just because a simple neural network is so, uh, so effective at identifying objects and classifying them. So uh, the stuff we learned in these labs were very applicable to computer vision and deep learning and are applicable to any sort of project where you need a neural network to do some image processing. My name's Kevin. My name 
I'm Sammy. I'm Jonathan. And so our first, our first big lab was the dice classification. Um, I really like this one because it was probably the simplest out of them, and we got the most. Uh, we got the, we got a cool result. And so what we first did to achieve this was grayscale, uh, basically getting rid of all the colors and just turning it to grayscale. And then we thresholded it to turn it into either black or white. Uh, this would simplify our uh, erosion and dilation, which basically allows us to, uh, I don't know, like increase or decrease the size of the blots. Um, and then once we have the blots at a good size, we would use a blob detection algorithm based on different factors to count the number of dots. And then finally, uh, to count uh, to uh, uh, account for different colored dye, we use HSV filtering uh, to separate them uh, via masks. So moving on from dice, we went on to site identification, which we used to actually control how the car moved. So we had two site things, which were the stop sites and the air sites. So we could differentiate them by a few factors. So the stop signs were fully convex, while the arrows, well, aren't. So that is how we separated those out. And then the arrows, because they're kind of like front heavy, you can look at their center of mass. And if it's in front of the horizontal line enough, you're moving forward. If it's to the left of the vertical or the right of the vertical, you're moving in that corresponding direction. And then we control the motor by a GPIO to turn and move forward or stop moving. So this was with pure computer vision. We could also use machine learning instead. Um, and uh, so moving along to the playing card classification lab, which Bob mentioned earlier, um, uh, one key question that we sought to answer was what do we do when our data is limited? Uh, and this is definitely a problem when you only have 53 different playing cards uh, and you want your model to actually work um, most of the time, as I said. Um, <laughs> And so we applied a technique called data augmentation, where essentially you increase the size of your data set um, by manipulating the images, as you can see above there, with uh, recolorings and uh, shifts and stuff like that. Um, and this uh, augments your data set, makes it much larger, which um, can make your model um, stronger and uh, more resistant to uh, training based on features that you don't want it to care about um, and extract the most meaningful data that it needs to understand in order to classify your playing cards or whatever you're classifying properly. Yeah. Back to the friendly camera. All right, thank you all. So quick summary of pocket erasers. Uh, as we mentioned, we uh, basically built the entire car around a Raspberry Pi that um, basically controls camera, uh, controls motors and driven by the batteries. And the camera data that's taken from the um, from the lens, it is then sent to the Pi where it basically runs a bunch of computer vision algorithms, machine learning techniques to basically extract meaningful information from that from that image, whether it's like a sign on the ground or like a racetrack wall or something like that. And then of course um, we can employ a variety of techniques to do this, like the computer vision techniques they talked about, or like by neural networks and machine, um, more like advanced machine learning concepts. Yeah, all right, and also we just like to, since this was our first year, uh, we would like to thank uh, Granger, who provided us with Raspberry Pis, which actually allowed us to do the project at all, uh, and then Yang Zhang, who is going to be a, going forward, is going to be like a mentor for us. So much pocket racers. Um, next up is RAP. Yeah, so this is a wireless RF and analog project, which is uh, actually making a communication system. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Grace. I'm Sayer. And uh, we're this lead, this the upcoming year's RAP leads folks here to help us present. My name is Nabil, and I was a member of the hardware team this year. I'm Faden, I was on the signal processing team. Uh, 
and I'm Ethan, uh, Harvard. I'm Ronstein. I'm Ethan. We were on uh, this year's rap league. Um, and you've already heard me talk, but I'm Dominic, but I was a, a, a member of actually both the hardware and DSP teams this year. Cool. So the IEEE Wireless RF and Analog Project is designed to give students the chance to get hands-on with implementing a digital communication system from scratch. So at a high level, you do just about everything that you need to get a string of bits from one microcontroller to another without any wires in between. And our project allows students to apply knowledge from really cool upper division courses like signals and systems, circuit theory, and analog circuit design. So to give a bit about what goes into a communication system, First, you start out with some data that you want to send. In our case, it's an information source, which is an STM, STM microcontroller. Um, and you translate the data into an electromagnetic wave, which gets sent through your transmitter hardware. And then after that, the wave um, travels through a communication channel, which is the air in our case. And unfortunately, the signal um, picks up a bunch of random noise and non-idealities in the air. So then it's the receiver's job to recover that wave and hopefully be able to decode and recover the data that your transmitter originally sent. So in terms of how this is all implemented, there's a lot of moving pieces to it, um, but to give a, a brief overview, first you have some binary bits that get converted to symbols and then modulated onto what's called a carrier wave, um, and that is what gets sent through an antenna, and then the, the receiver antenna um, picks up the wave and then converts it back into something that the um, receiver microcontroller can interpret into bits. So that's the, the big picture of RAP. Uh, now I'm going to pass it over to um, my fellow presenters who will go into more details about the system. Um, yeah. Yeah, so starting off, we first have to take our message, whether it's hello or as we'll see in our demo outside, just the letter H. Um, we need to convert that into binary. Uh, this is mapping it into ones and zeros. This is how all computers really understand data, whether it's text, images, whatever. Uh, then we map that into a digital signal called our digital baseband. This is basically taking that bit stream, formatting it at a certain data rate, which for us is 50,000 symbols per second. Then we take a carrier signal, which is basically just a high frequency sine wave onto which we put our information. Uh, for us, this is at one megahertz. We go through the process of modulation, putting that information from the, uh, the digital baseband signal onto the carrier through binary phase shift heating. Now you can see this in the bottom right, which is basically whether uh, the bit we are sending is a one or a zero, we will invert the carrier phase. All right, so I'm just going to talk a bit about the hardware. So we, our microcontroller operates at one megahertz. And if we need a, an antenna for this, it's going to be a very large antenna. That's why it won't even sit in the lab. Uh, pretty much the one we have right now for 27 megahertz. It's like these ones here. So let's run that by 27. Can't really do much with it. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to upconvert up our signal to 27 megahertz and broadcast this, broadcast this instead. This helps reduce our antenna size, but also basically going to be the FCC range. And here we can see our architecture for our transmitter. We have two upconverting stages, one for the 4 megahertz oscillator and one for the 2, 22 megahertz oscillator. So we need some components in order to be able to, to do this. So first, the first component are our amplifiers that help boost the strength of our signal. Very useful on the transmitter side. We need to actually get a strong enough signal to propagate through air and be able to receive it on the, on the receiver side. We also have mixers, which we, from the previous diagram we saw, we have two stages of. And what they do is they combine frequencies so that they sum a difference. Lastly, Roger, excuse me. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, the mixer converts the frequency into sum and the subtraction of the two frequencies. So we have to get rid of one of them. Uh, for the transmitter and the other one for the receiver. So how do we get rid of signals? We use filters. Um, also, when we are multiplying signals together, 
we need to have a reference signal, which is the oscillator. Um, and we make these oscillators ourselves um, because we can't just use a microcontroller oscillator because they don't go as high as we want them to. Um, so one major difference uh, this year was that we designed everything modularly, which means that each block was separate. It was first um, made in the simulations. As you can see, for example, we have LP spy simulation of a mixer over there. On the left, we have the ADS simulation of a power amplifier. Once these were done, we put everything together again in the LP spy simulation to um, make sure the whole system works. After that, we implement the PCBs and we test the PCBs and eventually we get something like this. On the left, you can see the receiver board. On the right uh, is the transmitter board. It will be outside too if you want to check them out. Okay, so, uh, so far we've seen amplifiers, oscillators, mixers, and filters. Um, however, even if these circuits function perfectly well individually, um, if we aren't careful, uh, they won't function optimally or may not even work when they're connected to one another. So when the boards are put together, they introduce a load on each other, interfering with circuit operation if it isn't what each circuit is already designed for. So therefore, it's necessary to match input and output impedances. Uh, this helps to drive power transfer, reducing signal reflection, and in some cases, the basic functionality of each circuit. So um, an example of this is uh, with our amplifiers. So throughout the RF front end, we must amplify a relatively weak signal. And uh, on the left is a common emitter amplifier. It's gain is proportional to the collector of resistance. And uh, you can see that if uh, there is a low output on the low, sorry, a low load, then uh, this will sort of, in our AC analysis, be parallel to the collector resistor, making it uh, reducing the amplification of the amplifier. So this has a high output impedance, and uh, here's another thing called a buffer, which is called your, uh, a common collector uh, configuration. And uh, the, high, the, the high input impedance of this matches the high output impedance of that. And because this has a low input impedance, when these are paired together, we're able to uh, amplify and uh, drive the tire through. Um, some other impedance uh, matching techniques we uh, featured are uh, T-pad attenuators, where if you put it between uh, two circuits, uh, each of the circuits will sort of see a, see a load, the load that we want to be determined by the resistance value. And on the right, we have a lumped elements network, which uh, is lossless and uh, is sort of like a complex phase shift version of the TS unit. So with these impedance matching techniques, we can finally put all these building blocks together into our Uh, on top of some of the hardware that we've talked about, another key point around is the system design and integration process. So you know what you want to put into your system and you know what you want to get out of it. So you really have to figure out how you're going to go from input to output. So you can start high level with block diagrams and picking which components you want to put into your design. And then once you have the big picture, you can go a little bit deeper and start designing each module while still understanding that you're not just uh, stringing parts together, it's important to understand how each component and its impedance and noise and everything affect the rest of the system as a whole. So you can create certain simulations and test them and revise them whenever you need to. So it's really an ongoing process that might take uh, a lot of iterations and teamwork between different people working on different components. But in the end, you'll understand not just how the system itself works, but also how to design systems in general which I think is a really valuable skill. And you can see here we have on the left uh, our final transmitter circuit schematic, which was kind of translated down from the block diagrams we showed you earlier over several steps, and then finally converted um, into a physical printed circuit board design that you see on the right side. All right, let's talk about some signal processing. <laughs> so um, how do we take bits and send them over a channel. So uh, we start with bits that are just ones and zeros, or we could also represent them as uh, symbols that are one or negative one. Uh, and so we're gonna use something called BPSK, meaning that we modulate um, a carrier wave 
um, to uh, flipping the phase uh, to represent our bits. Um, so here is a, um, actually a plot of an entire packet. Um, and so the reason why it looks like kind of all blue is that we actually have a carrier wave um, in between. Um, and so it's actually going up and down a ton of times, but that's why, that's why it looks blue. Um, and the shape of it is actually um, due to a filter. Um, when you design a communication system, it's important to have um, a filter on the, uh, both the transmitter and receiver end. Uh, we used a root raised, uh, square root raised cosine uh, filter. Um, and that uh, makes it so that all of our transmitted frequencies are, you know, within the, uh, what, what the F F FCC allows us to. Um, so anyway, uh, let's talk about the transmit, or let's talk about actually the receiver. Once, uh, once we receive something like this, how do we actually make sense of it? Um, so the first uh, thing that we need to do is demodulate um, and get rid of all these, um, this carrier frequency. Um, so that actually, um, you may uh, think that it's simple to just demodulate because you can just multiply and then filter, right? But there actually ends up being a little bit more complexity um, in the system in that um, the, we might not know the frequency of the received wave exactly. We know it's gonna be about one megahertz, but it could be uh, like 900 something kilohertz or maybe perhaps even a bit above. So we need to use something called Costa's loop uh, to actually recover that in order to kind of more intelligently demodulate to get a demodulated signal. Uh, once we do demodulate, um, we'll end up with something that looks a little bit like the um, orange signal. Um, and so then we've kind of recovered um, that. But even then, um, we're not done yet uh, because, uh, sure, we have peaks and we have uh, valleys where our points are, but if we just want to convert that to a stream of bits, how do we know which point to pick? Like, how do we know where a peak is and how do we know where a valley is? How do, how do we, what if we just pick a zero and then um, all of a sudden we've uh, made a bit error? So we need to do something called timing recovery uh, and we actually use a feedback control loop in order to realize that. Um, so knowing where our zeros are and then um, having uh, both proportional and integral control. Um, so then once we get that, um, we can easily commit or easily convert our, um, our, our ones and negative ones to our stream of bits. So, uh, simple enough, right? Uh, no, not quite. <laughs> um, we, uh, we implemented all that in MATLAB, um, and then, but you can't use MATLAB for an actual communication system. So we had to um, move over to our embedded microcontroller. So uh, what we used is this uh, STM Nucleo board, um, which uh, is great in many ways, but um, definitely was a bit of a challenge to translate um, our MATLAB over to this. Um, the processor is relatively slow compared to the frequency of the waves we were sending, and there isn't that much memory on it. Like, we can't store that long of a packet. So, um, uh, we had to do, we had to use um, some, C, some, some fancy built-in C libraries for um, the, uh, built into the, um, um, uh, the R market microcontroller. Um, but, um, honestly, this ended up being a, a pretty major um, limitation in our, our design. Um, so actually, when you see our demo, uh, we're sending a very, very short packet that consists of just a packet header, uh, which is about 15 bits, and then one character, uh, which in our demos, we, we chose the letter H because it used to be hello, and then we shortened it. Uh, and that's really just because of the um, RAM limitations on the receiver. Um, and we're working towards getting more characters by uh, there's some other tricks we can do, but we just wanted a proof of concept. So that's what we have. So yeah. We had to go from MATLAB to embedded C, that ended up being a challenge. Yeah, so this is basically what Dom was just going over. Uh, but one of the key things that we learn out of being on the signal processing team is just physics and hardware aware software design. Taking all of these signal processing algorithms that you might learn in class, and then going, oh shoot, our oscillators that Ramsey made, they're great, but they're not perfect. Or, oh no, it's picking up a bunch of noise as it goes through the air. Uh, we need to design signal processing algorithms that correct for that. Um, also, there was all these challenges of working on an embedded system, dealing with that processor, dealing with the RAM. We made some trade-offs, but it definitely taught us a lot about how to efficiently design these algorithms.
Yeah, just to, just to summarize. So far we went from this idea of being able to transmit a 27 megahertz into a reality. I mean, we have the, the character H, if you go outside you can see that. But there's a few things we didn't really talk about, the non-idealities that pop up from the mixer, from our transistors themselves, that are very important for us to keep in mind. Uh, from this diagram here, you can see that there, there are capacitances that do affect our model. And as a result, we all know capacitance is there, impedance is frequency dependent. So we have to be very mindful of what our impedances are at certain frequencies to be able to design a system that can amplify at a certain frequency. Another thing is that, uh, one thing we talked about this year was S-parameters. And pretty much what S-parameters are is it gives the ratio of the transmitted signal to the reflected. And being able to keep track of how much is reflected versus how much is transmitted is very important because ideally, in a math system, we want full transmission. Another thing that comes up fairly often is going through air is a very noisy environment. And we want to be able to, when we get in a signal, be able to fully filter out as much noise as we can, which physically we cannot always do perfectly. So these little tricks that we kind of find out as we go along from the DSP side, from the actual hardware, um, come into play at some point. have the uh, transmitter receiver separated by like 10 feet. Um, we actually also tested it across the room, but just for the sake of showing you where things are, we had them a little closer. Um, and we sent the letter H. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. All right, uh, thanks so much, Rap. Um, and so next up is, are you done? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, next up is Ops, um, open project space. Um, so here's Eli. Hello, hello, my name's Eli. I am one of your current open project space leads this year. My name is Miriam, and I am the other open project space lead this year. Okay, so as Dom mentioned, Ops stands for open project space. Um, and that kind of re uh, refers to what makes Ops so unique compared to all the other projects we offer here at IEEE. Um, so uh, because our goal is to get all of our students interested invest and invested in all of electrical engineering, regardless of how much background knowledge they actually have, um, instead of offering um, a single year-long capstone, we have many smaller projects throughout the year um, that teach an assortment of topics related to electrical engineering. Um, and in fact, today we are going to be presenting two of our mini capstones, our actual final capstone, and our new workshop program. Uh, so overall, our mission is to uh, introduce electrical engineering and to help build our um, foundation so that they can become engineering masters. Now what makes the ops program so unique, as opposed to other projects, is the integration of seven separate individual projects that focus on different areas of electrical engineering. Now, one of the great things that Miriam and I have implemented this year was a workshop program called Workshops. They're gonna workshop the name for next year because it's a little bit confusing and opposed to our workshop program actually offered by IEEE. But the focus of that was being able to give students um, other opportunities to work on different areas of electrical engineering that we didn't uh, really structure into a project, but made kind of a mini project in a work session that they were able to complete in their own time. We're actually gonna have our new ops leads, Lara and Adrian, present on that at the end. Um, in terms of other methods that we use this year, Ops is focused on building that ground up knowledge for not only just application um, for these students into the future of the courses, but also into the field. Uh, for a lot of these kids, Ops is the first project they have on their resume. It's the first few sets of skills that they get to understand the deeper feelings of what MicroMouse, you know, and DAB, um, and even Pog, well, I guess not really Pog Racer, but Rap well. Um, and so, um, just as a closing reflection, uh, it, it's been really amazing to have been an OPSI this year and see the growth that all these kids have made. Um, so we're actually having all three uh, of our main capstones present 
and we're going to start off with Shen Wing uh, presenting iPod Duino. So basically for this project, the goal was to use a passive buzzer to play a song by sending PWM signals at different frequencies that correspond to different pitches that are played by the buzzer. So for my iPod Duino specifically, I chose to play three songs from Studio Ghibli, which are from theme songs from House Moving Castle, Spirit Away, and Ponyo. And I remember it being really fun to combine both my music and TV skills in this project as I remember having to transcribe the songs onto a music sheet and then use the music sheet to code up each of the notes. Um, as you can see up there, we define different frequencies for each pitch which we use to code. And finally, to build on this project further, I wanted to add a bass part to the iPod Reno so that by using a different buzzer so that we can have two notes playing at once. So yeah, I also prepared a demo. This is my project for Game Bueno, Valor Int. We're going to see if we can get the display to work, maybe. Maybe. We're, we're trying things. Not sure I'm going to play it upside down, but uh, we can always try. So, uh, this is Valorant, where at the beginning, uh, you really can't see the screen, but each player chooses a weapon. You start off with $10, and after that you choose armor as well, and the armor just changes your health. And you go into a battle. Let's see if I can actually maneuver around. That, yeah, that thing that Miriam just picked up was the cash drop. You get $10 for it. I am a sitting duck because I don't know how to play upside down. <laughs> and, oh no, I think a wire might have gotten disconnected. <laughs> well, that's what it goes with uh, some live demonstrations and playing upside down. But, <laughs> I learned a lot, well, I learned a lot making this project. Uh, for one, I learned how to use the LCD and the OLED. And I also had to deal with unsigned underflow, which is always a pain. There was... Now what makes this project unique was multiplayer. As you saw, Miriam and I were playing at the same time against one another. And there's also customization. There's a total of 16 combinations of weapons and armor that each player can choose. And of course, no project is perfect. So some things I would have liked to add include a super move, a sort of once per match move that would help spice up gameplay, and sound effects, because right now the only sound effects are clacking of joysticks. Next, Carduino. Thank 
happen on it, which is just press it and then press the hand folding. And so it's what happens if you get too close, it backs up, it's the other way, it's just with your hand. And if you're at a specific distance, it just off. So you can press the button to go to entertain the other way. Yeah, so throughout this project, uh, this tested our knowledge of PID control and wireless serial communication. Um, a few challenges that we encountered, for one was finding proportionality constants to implement for a PID controller. Um, to address this, we kind of developed incrementally. Uh, we started with low proportionality constants, and through a series of tests, we gradually fine-tuned until we found the right constants to use. Um, another issue that we encountered was implementing the Bluetooth module. Uh, we realized that having one microcontroller wasn't enough to provide enough power for both the motor driver and the Bluetooth module simultaneously. So we had to connect another Arduino and use a common ground between the two so that we could provide enough power to both devices. Uh, in terms of application and future improvements, um, for one thing, we could use this kind of bar to you know, navigate an obstacle course or traverse a map or something like that. And we could also implement IR sensors um, and sensor fuse those values to um, have car turn. So, yeah, thank you. Hello, um, I'm Solara, and I'm also Adrian. <laughs> and we are next year's Opsleeve. And so we're going to be talking about the workshop program. The workshop, workshop program was implemented this year by Eli and Miriam. And it's a special program that um, sorry, that expands on the pro the concepts learned in ops um, with the time remaining. So students will go to an optional workshop workshop session to learn extra skills. Um, the three workshops we had one per quarter this year, but the first one, which was interactive breadboarding, because that's the first thing that you need in order to create a circuit. And then for winter quarter, it was intro to Arduino. And then lastly was a more overview of what the Industry, we called it, which taught you about transistors, um, soldering, and then also Eagle. And so we have two of the workshop projects, which is uh, the workshop also and two workshop projects, at least in general. So let's jump in. A couple quick things I'll mention before we demo the project. A uh, quick reflection of this year, workshops was very successful in introducing a lot of the new concepts that didn't really mesh that like perfectly into the current ops, ops curriculum. And so the workshops program, program is inherently very flexible in that it allows us to introduce a lot of new concepts. Looking towards next year, there is always room to improve. We are planning to revamp the workshops content in order to include a lot more material that will help introduce ops students into concepts that will be covered further in concepts such as DAV through, uh, through introducing workshops and other uh, sort of mini projects that you can approach during these workshops that you wouldn't otherwise be able to um, in, uh, be able to kind of complete within the main ops curriculum. So we have a couple of demos here. Uh, should I break? <laughs> so this is actually two circuits in one. We have a fan, which is, kind of, which is controlled by a potentiometer, as well as a circuit that controls two LEDs. Uh, in relation to two transistors. So let me hold up the fan so it doesn't. So you can see that if you if you turn the little dial on the potentiometer, based on a reading that the Arduino takes, oh, my fault. <laughs> uh, yeah. So based on a reading taken from the potentiometer of how much voltage is being supplied to it, the fan will either, there's supposed to be three settings, low, medium, and high, but you can't really tell the difference. So you'll just have to, uh, uh, trust. Not sure there will be that. <laughs> but yeah, so that's the fan. And then as for the transistor based circuit, we have two LEDs. If you just press the button, push the button here, you can see that it lights up the other LED. And the way that that works, oh. Uh, you can see it alternates between the blue and the green. And the way that that basically works is by sending current uh, through the blue LED at first. When you press the button, 
the orange is a lot to flow through this path here, which has a lot less resistance. The blue LED turns off since there's no longer enough current to power it. At the same time, when you press the button, the, uh, the transistor over here allows current to flow into the green LED, and that's how you achieve this alternating LED effect. And yeah, that's about it for the demos. Thanks so much, Ops. Um, yeah, can I get another round of applause for our five projects? The students have been working so hard all year, um, and so I'm glad that uh, we got to hear from um, hear about all their um, hard work. Um, anyway, so next up is actually we're transitioning to talk about our um, outreach program. So we've got uh, Nathan and Eli. Hey everybody, I'm still Eli. I'm still Nathan. <laughs> All right, we're your outreach coordinators for this year. Now I'm gonna start off by talking about, uh, well, it's kind of familiar, we were just on the topic of ops, the ops 2.0 program. Now, as your, outreach, uh, as your outreach coordinators, we deal a lot with helping other universities set up this program, which we call the ops 2.0 program. It, focus on, it focuses on developing the technical project which we talked about earlier, which is the ops program, but more in a set of teaching uh, student branches across the nation how to integrate this curriculum into their own student branch and then develop that on their own and make it fully self-sufficient. So a primary focus of ours is to focus on developing that curriculum as a base for their leads and then from then on we provide them funding through the University Partnership Program with IEEE and after that uh, the program is fully self-sufficient. It's run for two years I believe. The second year it's, uh, well the first year it's fully funded by UPP, in the second year it's half funded by UPP uh, for up to 60 members. Um, and we've actually had three fully established programs um, for uh, the Ops 2.0 program, so Chico State, University of Florida, and Alabama a and Now these three universities have successfully completed the entire onboarding process for Ops 2.0 and are entering, I believe, their second and third years now of running the Ops program. We actually have a picture of University of Florida in one of their ops lectures here, which was super cool to see. It's super great to see that growth. You know, from the ground up, we, we focus in ops, we focus on teaching students that knowledge from the ground up. But in ops 2.0, we focus on teaching those branches from the ground up. So it's a, it's a great way to see the full world, global and nationwide impact we can have on people. In addition to this, we have five programs currently in training, uh, two from University of Nevada, Reno and Vegas. In addition, we have Columbia, Gonzaga and Lamar University. Uh, these universities are currently in their training process for Ops 2.0. Uh, and we actually have a meeting this next week with another university, Temple University, um, where we're gonna intro the program to them as well. Uh, and so, it's super exciting to see the development we can make here and the impact we can make with IEEE branches across. But Nathan's actually gonna talk about the impact we can make here in LA, so. All right. Yeah, um, the main goal like, of, of us as outreach and also the IEEE UCLA Outreach Committee is we're just trying to help like those around us and then like build up their engineering communities, be it like um, kindergarten through high school, uh, community colleges, and also IEEE student branches through Ops 2.0. But one of the other things that we do is work with the UCLA San Juan Lee Transfer Center and we help like the, and work with the community colleges in our local LA area. One of the community colleges that we work a lot with is the El Camino Community College. And there, um, over the past year and a half, we've been helping them develop their own technical workshop series that they hold every semester. Um, very similar to like the, the stuff that we cover in ops. Um, we teach them, or we taught those students like how to run their own lectures, how to, how to teach the content, and how to run this semesterly workshop series themselves. And then every, every semester we go to El Camino campus and then just like bring a few volunteers and help out with them. But it's all student run by them. And I, I think that's very important because it's like, the, or like us being able to like help them like be self sufficient and like grow their own engineering community themselves and like be be on their own is like very important to us. And so like these workshop series culminate in their semester at Quadrino competitions, um, similar to as Shannon was showing earlier. Um, each of the students create their own at Quadrino and then they all vote on who creates the best the best song and it's a, it's a really fun time. And also like and the main thing that students get out of these 
workshops is that the practical skills kind of jumpstart their engineering career. And one of the main applications that we see, like that we directly see, is we actually invite these community college students, including other community colleges too, uh, to our Idea Hacks Hackathon. Um, this is the first year that we had community college students participate. And 15 students from these El Camino workshops um, actually came to UCLA campus and participated in our hardware hackathon and used the skills that directly and directly applied the skills that they learned from these semester workshops to be able to create a fully um, a fully tangible product at this hackathon. Um, and then we also do work with other community colleges, um, and we just just try to support like as many schools as possible in the area through like environmental resource inviting them to events and like providing more resources. And also at Idea Hacks this year, we had six students from Santa Monica College and five students from East LA College also participate at Idea Hacks. And then... All right, and then just as a general note, <laughs> if you if any of you are in IEEE right now and are interested in Outreach Committee, you're going to open an application soon towards the end of the year. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. Also, if you have any questions, concerns, hopes, dreams, uh, ales, I guess, you could please email us at outreach at IEEEbrewers.com. We're super excited to be here this year with the opportunity to you know, work together with the community. This is the first year we actually have two outreach coordinators, so we're planning to cover a lot more ground this year um, in terms of outreach. So I know we're going to be super excited for that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, thanks, outreach. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, that's um, all of IEEE's content, but we actually have our special guests here today, um, uh, ASME. They actually have, uh, I think, four groups that are going to um, talk about their projects that, that they've been working on. So I'm super excited uh, to see what that's about. Um, you guys ready? I'm Alex, I'm also one of the leads for Underwater Robotics. Yeah, so just a little bit about our project. Um, we build basically an underwater robot, uh, specifically an underwater remotely operated vehicle, or ROV. Um, it's, so it's a pilot controlled um, underwater robot, so the water is underwater, our pilot is next to the pool, or you know, next to the water. I'm controlling it, um, we use a PS4 controller for that. And uh, specifically for our project this year, we competed in a mate ROV competition which is a competition where we compete against other schools across the country um, uh, to complete a series of tasks in a pool. Um, for example, picking up PVC pipes, following lines, et cetera. Um, this year, we qualified for the world competition, for the main ROV competition. Um, basically, the way the qualification works is that you have to send in a video showing that um, your ROV can complete a series of tasks that the uh, competition specified. Um, and if you show your ROV is capable of that, um, about our bot this year. Um, you can see the picture on the right side. Um, it was powered from a 48 volt power source um, off board next to the pole. Um, it has three arms that are powered by pneumatics. Um, these arms are for grabbing things, dropping things. Um, move around, it has six thrusters. Um, you can see three of them in this frame. Um, so they're little propellers that allow it to move around. Um, in order for the pilot to see in the pool, we uh, had three cameras um, that you know, that gave different viewpoints of the ROV and the pool um, for the um, pilot to see um, and to get an idea of you know, what's around the ROV and how to navigate it. For the electronics, um, ele electronics and water don't go very well together, so we had two water type boxes that basically house all our onboard electronics. Um, and in order for the electronics to actually control any of our stuff, um, we used two, we used uh, a Raspberry Pi as an onboard computer. Um, it ran the ROS middleware, um, which allowed it to communicate with basically all the electronics and tell them what to do. Um, the Arduino Omega was the big workhorse on our robot, um, as we made a custom PCB that mounted on the Arduino Omega. This PCB controlled the um, speed controllers that um, told the thrusters how fast to move, and it also controlled the solenoid valve, which would open and close the valve. 
I'll begin the next slide. We have yeah, we have our demos of it. Um, yeah, we should probably turn off the sound. Um, yeah. So unfortunately, there's no water here, um, so we can only really show videos of it. But this was our first time tossing a robot into the pool. Um, basically, its only job was to move around. And yeah, you can see it just the, how it getting used to the capabilities of it, what it feels like to like, move up and down. Um, and then the second one is when we got the arms to start working. Um, here you can see the arms open and close. Um, so, uh, yeah, when we got the arms to work, that was um, our primary test for that. Um, one other thing we made this year was actually profiling float. It was an experimental project. Um, basically, we wanted to create a device that can move up and down in the pool um, without any thrusters. So, it basically, it would. Um, it would be a little container that would intake water. And then, because it intakes water, it changes its density, allowing it to sink. And then if you push the water back out, it will float back to the surface. Um, so here's a quick 30 second video of what that um, looks like. You can see the thing come down. Um, and then if you wait a few seconds, it's going to come back up to the surface all on its own, just by um, taking in and expelling out. There it is, coming back up to the surface. Yeah, and then our final uh, demo is what we had to send into the competition. Um, so here you're going to see our ROV in, uh, in the pool. And you can see it moving around the little tent. That was one of the tasks that we had for it to do. Um, the ROV had to grab onto a little tent and then move around the pool. Um, so you can see um, our robot dragging it around. Um, and then its goal is to cover a little bowl that's on top of that black line. Um, yeah, it takes a few seconds for it to do it. But um, yeah. And then one of the other tasks we had to do, what we had to do, is um, insert a syringe into the tent. Um, and it's kind of hard to see, but you can see the ROV holding something and trying to drop it into the tent. Yeah. That little red thing. see that um, our pilot had enough control to move the syringe. Um, okay, so for next year, we're planning to do another competition called RoboSub, and this one is going to be completely autonomous. So there's no pilot, we literally just toss the robot into the pool, and it has to be able to navigate itself and do a variety of tasks. So uh, I saw a lot of your guys' projects. Uh, a lot of your skills that you learned this year will be relevant in RoboSub. Uh, so for example, we're going to be using a lot of PID controls to control our robot. Uh, we're going to have to do a lot of signal processing. So in RoboSub, they have uh, underwater pingers that we're going to have to like take their signal process it and know where our robot is relative to those pingers. Uh, we're going to have to do a lot of computer vision next year, so uh, we're going to have to identify various targets underwater and be able to uh, navigate our robot relative to those targets. For that, we're going to be using an NVIDIA Jetson computer as they're on board. Um, we're also going to have to use a lot more different sensors, so we're going to be using depth sensors, hydrophones, sonars, uh, and we're going to have to design a lot of custom PCBs for all of these sensors. 
that we're going to have to use. Uh, next year, we're also transitioning to ROS2 as our middleware. Uh, ROS2 is a bit different from ROS1 in that they completely rewrote everything. So um, we're going to have to uh, relearn that kind of from scratch. And then a cool thing about next year is uh, there's going to be torpedoes. So one task is we're going to have to launch torpedoes at these two different targets. And part of that is using computer vision to identify which target is the right one to shoot. Uh, and then we get points for hitting them. <laughs> so uh, if you're interested, uh, please come check out our table later. Uh, or you can also find us at the ASNE table at Enormous Activities Fair next year. Uh, yeah, hope to see you guys. Yeah, that's all for us. I think the next one is excellent. Hi, how's it going? Uh, my name is Daniel, and I'm one of the X1 Robotics League leads, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about our project. So what is X1 Robotics? X1 Robotics is a super cool project we have at ASME, um, where we pitch a robot every year. Doesn't matter what the robot is. Um, one that keeps coming up is a peanut butter and jelly sandwich maker. We've had a fish-controlled robot. We have everything. Um, so student pitch, and then we take the, the winning pitch, and we build that robot over the course of two years. So we have two robots going on at a time. One's in more of like a research development cycle and the other one's in more of a manufacturing cycle. But um, the thing with these projects is because they're such, you know, encompassing like, how do you build a fish controlled robot? How do you build a peanut butter and jelly sandwich building robot? They require a lot of mechanical engineering, but also a lot of systems, electrical, computer science. Um, so you really get like a very full uh, circle experience with the projects we build. So our current projects that we're building this year is Bolt, our robot dog, um, named after the movie Bolt and also Bolter Hall. Um, and then our project that we started this year is Wally. -E. Um, so to give you a little bit of background on Bolt, Bolt's a super cool um, robot dog, but it requires a lot of complex quadruped motion because having four legs is hard. Um, if you ever tried to walk on all fours, you'll see it's kind of difficult. Um, but so we have to do a lot of really um, interesting kinematics. Um, some different forward and inverse kinematics um, that we spent a lot of time uh, just you know solving those and then writing them into code. Um, so the controls we've used for this, we have a Raspberry Pi that talks to a Teensy and tells kind of all these motors where how to move. We have a total of 14 motors in Bolt, 12 um, for the legs alone. Then we have two for like the, the head and the mouth because um, he's still a dog, so he has to look cute and bark. Um, one of the cool things about Bolt is that we have been 3D printing everything. Um, so the legs, the spine, um, not the motors, of course, but we could have <laughs> maybe done that. But the uh, 3D printing and the rapid prototyping is a really cool aspect of Bolt. Um, every time we've encountered an issue, we've been able to say, okay, print it, tomorrow we come back in, new leg, new setup, and we keep going. Um, so we've been doing a lot of different types of uh, plastic. We've been doing PLA uh, or TPU, and we're even looking into PETG for some different uh, parts of Bolt's leg. Um, and then a really cool um, thing we got to do actually this quarter was we got to talk to um, one of the research labs here at UCLA Romella. Um, and Professor Hong gave us feedback with his grad students on you know, where our robot was kind of at, what kind of steps to take forward. So we get to do a lot of cool collaboration with grad students um, as well as professors on some of these cool um, research and advanced robotics projects. So I have a little video of Bolt. Um, as you can see, this is Bolt on the, his test stand walking. Um, he's got a pretty good little motion going. He has to shift each of his legs forward individually to maintain his uh, balance, and then he shifts his entire body weight forward. But this was a lot of math to, <laughs> to figure out, but it was a super cool problem to tackle. Um, and our CS team was phenomenal, phenomenal getting this um, up and running. Um. So our next project that we have is Wally, which started this year, um, and it's based on the movie Wally. Um, and so we had a lot of different uh, problems to tackle with this. One of the biggest ones being, how do we take trash and turn it into a single unit to dispense? Um, so we were going to compact it, but compacting is kind of a very hard thing to do, um, especially with like little bits of trash. So we switched to a shredding design. So you can see in the second picture right here, this is our shredder that we've been testing, building out of um, plastic first, uh, and then we're gonna manufacture it with steel. Um, 
So we have you know this cool internal shredder that shreds the trash, and then we have a gantry system that actually puts it into a bag and dispenses it as one unit. So while we're not making these little cubes, we are still getting out a little bag that you can just throw away. Um, it'll be interesting to see the sound or hear the sound that Wally makes while shredding it because we'll have metal blades shredding aluminum cans and everything. But um, it'll be fun. We can hear the little cassette player like in the movie and you can play a song instead of listening to the metal shredding. Um, another cool thing we got to do with Wally is the arms uh, are using linear actuators from Progressive Automations. Um, and so they're a really cool sponsor that we have that um, is giving us opportunities to use a bunch of different types of uh, hardware. Um, and Wally, just like uh, Bolt, is also being controlled with the Raspberry Pi uh, and the Teensy. One thing that a lot of our robots have is they have that same kind of setup with the Raspberry Pi and the Teensy, but we really are looking to expand to more, um, you know, either different um, chips or ways to make things autonomous. A lot of our robots are like, let's make it autonomous. And then we're doing all this other stuff, and then they don't end up being autonomous, but they still work. Um, another cool thing we got to do uh, is Mike Seta, the head of droids at Lucas Films, actually came and gave a talk um, that we hosted. Um, it was super cool. He brought his own Wally, um, which is absolutely amazing. I highly suggest Googling him or YouTubing him. He has some great videos. Um, and we're actually going to be talking with NASA's uh, own trash shredding and compacting team, which is also, funnily enough, called Wally, um, this, uh, this year as well. Um, to work with them and kind of get some advice on our design. Um, and here, as you can see, um, this up here, this little video shows our, our little gantry system. Um, it kind of takes a bag and then it'll push it, squeeze it along that path. Um, and that's gonna be inside the bot as well. Um, you can see another picture of Wally right here. And then we also have this really cool wiring diagram. As you can see, that's a lot of wires. Um, <laughs> for us mechanical engineers, it takes us a little bit to figure that out, but uh, we have a cool system going on here. Um, we got to power a lot of motors, a lot of linear actuators, um, and we're going to have a remote control for Wally as well. Um, but that is all I have for you guys today. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to pass it off to Combat Robotics. Hi, everyone. I'm Maya. I'm one of the technical leads for Combat Robotics at ASME. So in our program, we build beetleweight robots for competition. These are three pound robots. If you've ever seen the show BattleBots, it's kind of like that, but on a much smaller scale. So what this project looks like is over the course of a year, teams design, manufacture, and fight with their robots. So our teams consist of three to five people. Uh, our program, we don't require any experience, and well, uh, Within ASME, we do target this program as a beginner-friendly, like, MECI program. We do have members from all engineering disciplines as well as non-engineering STEM majors and people from all years in university. Our members get to gain experience in skills such as design, CAD modeling, and manufacturing. Uh, during the beginning of the year, we hold weekly meetings where technical leads provide lectures on tools such as SOLIDWORKS and on essential skills like soldering. We also provide lectures on a breadth of information such as material selection, design, and all sorts of things pertaining to how to build an awesome combat robot. So there are many ways in which our teams will approach their robots and they are given complete creative freedom. So these designs consist of a custom made chassis as well as a weapon. Now this weapon usually looks like some piece of metal that spins really, really fast. And that can look however you want. As you can see from some of the designs that are up here and were on the previous slide, uh, that can look like a horizontal spinner where you have a bar that spins really, really fast. Or sometimes people make it so there is a shell on the outside of their bot and the entire outer body of the robot spins and that becomes their weapon. So there are many different approaches. One of my favorite things about this project is that because you're working within such a small team, you have a lot of creative freedom and a lot of say over how the robot is made. And you have a lot more opportunities to get hands-on technical experience. So the process of actually creating these robots, there is 3D printing, people usually 3D print their chassis, and there is machining work in creating the weapons as well as armor or any other metal components. 
Every team is given a budget with which they can purchase whatever parts or components they need to fulfill their uh, ambitions and create whatever robot they want. And our robots look very, very cool. So what this project timeline looks like is in the fall quarter, teams are formed, they design, they create CAD models, and they are given a des design review and feedback so they can optimize their designs. In the winter quarter, we manufacture the robots, 3D print everything, machine everything, and wire and solder our electronics. And in the spring quarter, the main event, our competition, SoCal Smackdown. So SoCal Smackdown is a collegiate tournament held here at UCLA. It is an annual event. This year, we held it for the second time and we'll be holding it again next year. This year, participants included uh, UC Santa Cruz, Cal Poly, Stanford, UC Berkeley, and some hobbyists who like to do this for fun. Uh, what this event looks like is competitors fight head-to-head -head in three-minute matches or until one of the robots is like destroyed and can't move anymore. And winners are determined by a panel of judges. And this is done within a plexiglass cage, so it's a, it's a very safe uh, process, but also very fun. So this program is, is really cool. And if you are interested, I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, that's all we have from Combat Robotics. I'm gonna pass this off to the next project. Thank you. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Steven. I'm one of the lead of flagship Combat Robotics. And I made the other lead flagship. So yeah, very similar to the three pound Combat Robotics that ASME offers, uh, we compete in 12 and 30 pound weight classes. So very similar, we have three man matches where you're trying to basically dismantle the other bot, um, except in these competitions, the bots are 12 and 30 pounds, so you have a lot more weight to play around with, a lot more disruption and action kind of takes place. Um, what sort of sets us apart from the three pound combat robotics is we're mainly focused on learning like higher level skills and more advanced manufacturing techniques like CNC and also um, just more in-depth control with what our bot is actually doing. Um, and we also focus on a lot more design aspects like durability and we have a very active and effective weapons and also making our bots radio controlled. So yeah, this year we competed with two 15 pound robots uh, named Cheddar and the Ultimate Rotational Destroyer also known as Turd. Uh, Cheddar, it was designed to be a flywheel flipper. Essentially, it was storing energy in a ro rotating flywheel and would transfer that energy through a couple of mechanisms into actually a uh, flipping motion. The goal would be to actually throw the opponent in the air and causing damage upon impact. Um, and that involved a lot of complex mechanisms and machining and a lot of different uh, tools that we were able to get use on UCLA's campus like water jet, CNC, um, and yeah. And also, our other robot was Turd. Uh, where the weapon was spinning up a sort of cylindrical drum, um, and there were some protrusions on that drum that would sort of feed into the opponent. Um, the main goal of that robot was sort of durability and uh, weapon effectiveness, and um, that we actually won two awards at our competition this year. We won Most Innovative for Cheddar and all their complex mechanisms, and uh, King of the Ring uh, for Turd. Uh, yeah, and the, you can see on that GIF, that's sort of a diagram of the mechanisms going on within Cheddar, and we can sort of explain it a little bit more uh, looking at the pot after that. So for next year, we're actually expanding our reach a little bit. We're moving to 30 pound and 12 pound, which are both weight classes we have not previously done before. And because of that, we're gonna be having to do a lot more new and experimental things as we design our bot. So our 30 pound bot, the one in the top right corner over there is going to be propeller. It's going to be a 30 pound bot that spins essentially three bars very quickly so that it can protect itself from all sides. The interesting thing that we're planning for that is using a Kiwi drive. So that's essentially using Omni wheels, that three Omni wheels in triangle, and they spin at different speeds and that allows it to translate to any direction, which means in order to get that to work, we're gonna need a lot of electronics, we're gonna need a lot of code work to get that Kiwi drive to work, especially since our robot will also be getting hammered by tons of other robots while it's trying to drive. And for our 12 pound bot, we have Orgle Bombardment. So what we're planning to do with that is have a arm over there and you have a spinning disc on the end. And we are essentially just gonna like rocket down that spinning disc onto the top of the opponents. So we're also gonna need a lot of electronic work from that, a bit less than the Kiwi drive, but still we want to have the arm encoded so that we can properly control where it is, how it's moving, and keep it in a very precise motion. 
And one last thing that we're planning to do for both of the bots is possible is a custom controller project. So similar to IEEE and their receiver project, we want to build our own custom controllers that can essentially communicate between us and our robot. That will give us a bit more freedom in what we can do and possibly more controllers, more control of everything that we want to do with all of these bots. So if you're interested in that kind of project and you want to apply that to a very like real world situation, then we invite you to join us with Flagship to work on our custom controllers. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, guys. Thank you. All right, so that's it for our presentations. Thank you again to ASME. Um, this year, they actually have a new lounge right next to the IEEE lab, so there's a lot of interbothering between the two groups, and we hope to collaborate with them even more in the future. Um, I think you guys met me earlier. My name is Jackie. I was in DAB. I'm also the incoming IVP for IEEE. So I would just wanted to say thank you for everyone for coming out. I know it's it was an early morning, a Saturday, and you have probably some fun things to do, but you decided to come here, and we're so grateful for your support, and we hope to see you come out to more of our future events. At this time, if you're with the community colleges, um, please exit, and Wes is going to give a little, little speech for you guys in uh, an adjacent room. So as you are comfortable, you can start to make your way out with Eli and Nathan as your guides. And yeah, Dom is gonna close it off with a couple announcements and we can continue with the programming. And food is coming soon. Yeah, so uh, thanks so much for coming and, and, and uh, thanks so much, Jackie, for uh, doing a lot of the work to coordinate this event. Definitely would not have been uh, possible without uh, the work that Jackie's done. So anyway, uh, we actually are a bit ahead of schedule. Notice that it says 1.30 p.m. for lunch, uh, and so we're actually done uh, presenting everything that we have to present. So what we're actually gonna do is start the gallery section a bit early, and then pizza should arrive around 1.20 to 1.30, that kind of range. So um, go ahead and mosey on outside and check out, um, ask any questions about the projects that were presented today, and we'll just go ahead and see the demos. Uh, a lot of cool stuff to see, so uh, go ahead and check it out. Uh, and then lunch will be here soon. I know you're probably getting hungry for this one. Thanks so much for coming on your Saturday.